So I'd like to welcome everybody this evening. Um, Jill Officer, as you know, is um, incredibly experienced and accomplished, and Jill is going to share her experience um, with brushing both from an athlete's perspective, a coach, and Jill has also been involved in some of the studies. So Jill is bringing um, a players on ice perspective as to her observations as to what has worked and what hasn't. A few little housekeeping items. Uh, first, if you move your cursor around, at some point you will come upon a little bubble with a microphone in it. So if you would all please click on that and that will mute you. If we hear too much background noise, we're going to have to mute everybody and um, we will open up the mics later on for questions. With regards to questions, you please use the chat box when you're muted if you have any questions. And we're going to leave the questions to the end of the presentation and deal with them all at once. Um, the other item is that Jill does have some videos embedded in her presentation. So uh, we're hoping that there is enough bandwidth for everybody that the videos will be viewable. If not, we're going to try them outside of the presentation. She'll pull them up and we'll have a look. And if that doesn't work, then Jill is going to share her presentation with me, with the videos, and we will get that to everybody so that you can view it and um, also listen to her presentation at the same time and be able to view it all at once. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Jill. Jill is a six-time Canadian champion, two-time world curling champion, and long-time second for Jennifer Jones. She's an Olympic gold medalist, if I forgot to say that as well, but who could forget that? Jill will cover topics such as physical positioning, biomechanics, strength training, as well as the current science and theories that teams are testing with regard to what appears to be working. Jill's also going to touch a bit on the difference between men's teams and women's teams with regard to brushing. So Jill, I'm going to pass the presenter role to you. And take it away, please. Okay, I hope um, everybody can hear me. Andrea, can you hear me? I can, yes, you're very clear. Okay, great. I'll just get this up into a slideshow here. Okay. So, um, I, yeah, I, as Andrea mentioned, uh, you know, I've been a long time, uh, long time elite player with uh, Jennifer Jones and um, uh, Olympic studies, two-time world champion, and one thing that we did a lot of was uh, brushing. We did a lot of stuff around brushing. Prior to uh, 2010, um, we actually started sort of working with a, bio a couple of biomechanists that uh, we knew here locally. Uh, we um, did some work around that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we, we also did some more work with the biomechanics around 2012, 2013. And uh, we learned a lot from doing those things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about body positioning and strength training to go with that. Uh, there's somebody I think that might not have their mic muted. Could everyone just check please? You know what? I'm going to mute everybody. Um, so. Yeah, and then then we won't have that problem. Um, and then I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, the science or whatever science we can determine with curling, given all the variables. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of theories out there. I have uh, some of my own opinions and. I have some opinions about men versus women, one per, one sweeper versus two sweepers, um, and I think I still have a pretty good grasp on who the teams, uh, which teams are best to watch when you're trying to uh, learn more about sweeping. 
first of all, I'm going to tell you what not to do. Uh, so I had a little bit of a habit of, of falling. Sometimes it was just from the weight that I was putting on the broom and then being told to stop. And then other times I would just lose my gripper. Um, so one thing you don't want to do is fall. Another thing you don't want to do is break your broom. <laughs> How did you and break the broom in that picture, Jill? Uh, last year I was playing with uh, Team Flurry and I was sweeping a rock and it literally just snapped on me. So I'm guessing that there was some sort of maybe hairline fracture in there from, uh, you know, transporting it, the, the brooms in a bag via airplane. Um, cause those brooms are supposed to be pretty strong. Uh, and I don't think I'm actually that strong to break it. So, uh, it was just kind of funny that, uh, that that happened. And, and that day I actually wasn't the only one that broke a broom. Uh, I think Tim March broke his broom doing the same thing that day hmm. in Cornwall last year. Okay. And of course we don't want to trip teammates. Many of you might remember that. I actually had no idea what had happened in that shot, so I actually had to look up at the uh, Jumbotron in the arena and realize that it was Caitlin that actually tripped Dawn, and then that's why I started laughing, because I literally had no idea what had happened. So those are a few things, of course, you don't want to do when you're sleeping. Uh, so in terms of biomechanics and the positioning that uh, you want to see when when you're um, you know working with your teams or if you're working at camps or working with with younger people, these are some of the things that I feel very strongly about. These are some things that have come from the work that we did with biomechanists, uh, like back in it was around 0809 that we did some work uh, on ice with a couple of people here. And then we actually did more extensive, we did more extensive work with a biomechanist here in Winnipeg that um, actually worked more with hockey goalies. And he worked on a sort of a circular hockey pad rink that had all the video analysis set up on it. So we sort of worked the ice as best we could. Obviously, it wasn't curling ice, but the idea was that we wanted to be able to do some work with the video analysis and have a biomechanist give us some uh, feedback on things that we could be doing. So from from those two, you know, experiences with biomechanists, along with um, just testing things out, uh, helping each other on the team, uh, you know, try to be better sweepers, and then working with a, a smart broom. I think I did see Will Hamilton in here, and uh, that's been a great invention for being able to. Uh, you know, in, uh, improve your sweeping. So these are some of the things, um, staying on your toes and bending your knees. If, you, if you're actually leaning on your broom and you bend your knees, your toes will go, your heels will come up. So you kind of automatically go on your toes. Uh, so just keeping those knees bent. You want to get your legs out as much as you can. Uh, you know, the footwork involved in it usually involves one leg kind of being out at any given time uh, to the best that you that you can. When we were do <clears throat> pardon me, when we were doing some of the work with the biomechanist, we sort of felt that and and discovered that a bit of a figure eight working of the feet seemed to work fairly well. Uh, so it was it was like a shuffle, but with the the sort of figure eight, so that you're always getting your trying to get your feet out from underneath you. Chest over the broom head, uh, you know, that's something you always want to work toward. And I think uh, a little trick that you can do with people, uh, especially maybe younger teams or developing teams or, or uh, at a camp, is to use a bathroom scale and actually have them get into their sweeping position and test out leaning forward and leaning more forward on it to see how much more weight they're actually putting on the broom. It's just it's just sort of to get the idea of where they're supposed to be. I am a huge proponent of wearing gloves. I can't believe the number of people that don't wear gloves. Kids that come to curling camp and they don't wear gloves. They don't. It, it, to me, it just makes all the sense in the world to have gloves on. It helps improve your grip. It gives you confidence to 
um, uh, be able to lean on the broom a little bit more. Uh, I actually, in searching for some pictures of specific players for this presentation, I was actually surprised to see some of the elite players that don't wear gloves and they must have incredible grip strength and, and uh, no, no sweaty hands to be able to actually do that. But uh, gloves to me uh, are, are really, really huge part of sweeping. When I teach sweeping, uh, shoulder shoulder width grip, and I say this approximately because I know that mine is actually a little bit wider, but in terms of dealing sometimes with younger people, um, the point I think is, the big point with this is to avoid having chicken wing. <laughs> so that upper arm being out of control and not not sort of keeping the upper broom in, in control. I think you just want to you know, give that as a guideline so that that doesn't happen. Uh, something else that we discovered, um, you know, and you'll see in the next the next slide, um, you'll see a couple of pictures of Dawn uh, from our team in terms of uh, sweeping. And so Dawn actually went from an open stance to a closed stance sweeping. But through that process and us kind of working uh, w uh, together with her on that, we worked a little bit and played around a little bit with grip and the position of the grip, uh, particularly on the bottom hand. And it's really important to have that over the top sort of grip. So I've seen people, uh, you know, again, kids particularly, I've had kids come and they actually have an underhand grip or they have a grip that is somewhere between overhand and underhand. Um, but you're not going to be able to get as much weight on the broom as you can if you have a grip like that. You kind of need to have that overhand grip a little bit so that you're getting most of the pressure on the palm of your hand. And a good way to sort of figure that out, we determined, was that if you look at your hand um, and you see the V between your thumb and your pointer finger, once you take the grip of the broom, that V should be approximately pointing towards your chest. Um, you know, it might be a little bit more toward uh, the downarm side of, of your sweeping, but somewhere in there should give you a pretty good grip. And another thing I see a lot with younger people is finger pointing, and they point that pointer finger down the shaft of the broom. And uh, again, I'll talk about it in the, a little bit in the next slide, but that was something that Dawn used to do a really long time ago. And it really prevented her from trusting herself to be able to put weight on the broom because it was sort of taking the pressure um, more into her finger as opposed to the bulk of her hand. So that's just uh, something I think maybe gets overlooked a little bit sometimes. And then slider versus uh, no slider. I think there's, you know, different opinions out there. I think there's a uh, you know, a lot of people think it's cool to sleep with, sweep with a slider. Um, I think for the most part, though, I'm going to say 98% of the time, I think people should be sweeping with a gripper. I say this particularly with women. I think that women, because we just don't have the same body mass and the same strength that men do, I think we get more out of our sweeping when we have two grippers on. And even on the men's side, I would say that, you know, there's a hand, a small handful of people that are getting the full effects of their uh, body mass and their strength out of sweeping with a slider. That would be someone like Ben Hebert, um, uh, maybe Brett Gallant. But if you've ever seen those people in person, uh, they're absolutely jacked. They are huge. They're broad. And... Um, you know, that obviously contributes to to it as well. But I, I'm a really big proponent in always wearing two grippers. So I mentioned this a little bit. This is just, uh, so this was years ago. Dawn was an open stance sweeper. Um, now she's a closed stance sweeper. You don't see the finger point anymore. <laughs> she gets a lot more weight on the broom. But of course, the thing was different, uh, you know, in the picture on the left, sweeping was different back then. You know, we didn't have directional sweeping and the position of our broom head in front of the rock was different. Um, but what I wanted to show with this is that there, I think there's maybe a little bit of debate about open stance versus closed stance. Um, 
or if there isn't, I think it's going to come up again. And I'll tell you why. Because as much as I believe from a biomechanical standpoint that a closed stance will give you more power, with the directional sweeping that we see happening now and players being a little more behind the rock, particularly the inside sweeper, when they're a little bit more behind the rock and the angle that they get to sweep directionally in front of the rock, the angle is different with an open stance. And I'm going to refer back to the Briar and the World of 2019. And if you go back and watch Team Kevin Cooey, you may have noticed that on certain shots, uh, Colton and Ben were both, they're both closed sweepers, closed stance sweepers. But on certain shots, and I believe it was anywhere uh, back line to half weight-ish, they would switch sides and it was something to do with the theory. Uh, I did talk to them briefly about it, but um, it was something to do with the theory that the angle of their broom head in front of the rock with the open stance had a greater effect on um, trying to make a rock curl or keeping it straight. But they only did it on the half weight shots, and I don't exactly remember why. But I won't be surprised to maybe see that happening a little bit more, uh, just simply because we've changed the direction of the broom head in front of the rock. So I have a couple of videos here of Caitlin. Um, and as much as, uh, you know, I worked with Caitlin and curled with Caitlin, um, despite that, I think that she's the best female sweeper in the game. I have these couple of videos just to show you. They're actually, these videos are about four, four, four and a half years old. So there's a couple of things that I will point out that I, I know would be different now. One of those things is just the, the angle of the broom head in front of the rock in these videos. She would probably be hanging back. Her body would be back a little bit more than it is in these videos. But the point is, uh, it goes to show the biomechanics of, um, you know, the footwork and getting the knees bent, having one of the, like, one foot out at all times and getting as much weight over the top of the broom as you can. Um, and with Caitlin, she actually has open stance and closed stance. So I'll just show you both here. So this is her open stance. And you can see we're using the smart broom here, um, which is a really great tool. And I, I will talk about that a little bit later. But you can see basically the footwork here, one in, one out, one in, one out, a little bit of, uh, you know, figure eight type movement. And then this is her closed stance. Hopefully you're seeing these videos, not bad. They're coming through very well, Jill, uh, uh, from my perspective anyway. Okay, great. And you can see like, you know, she's, she's pretty over the broom and she's got, uh, you know, good position you know, I think with this, and it's very effective. Now, again, if you've ever seen Caitlin in person, you know that she's not she's not a big person, um, but she maxes out on what she has to offer. Uh, she works really hard in the gym to be able to do that, and she works really hard at her sweeping to be able to do that as well. Speaking of gym, um, you know, uh, sweeping really is sort of full body <laughs> when you look at it. Um, you you kind of have to cover all parts of the body, uh, some major parts, some more stability parts, I believe. Uh, you can see here that Brad Thiessen from Team Botcher, who's probably one of the best men sweepers out there, is practically doing a plank on his broom. So that's why planks are huge and plank variations I think it's not just about holding a plank for as long as you can, but doing plank up downs or plank um, like side shuffles or narrowing the uh, stance of your hands with a plank and doing variations around that. Uh, ball rollouts, you see that a little further down the list, that can mimic, um, you know, the plank position that you would have on a broom. And then it works some of those uh, stability muscles along with your core. And again, it, it, like plank and sort of push up is kind of what Brad's doing here on on the broom. So push ups are another really big important exercise for for curlers. And I think when Brad did an Instagram takeover for Curling Canada over the summertime, I believe he does something like 120 or 130 push ups per day. 
And again, if you've ever seen Brad in person, he also is really jacked, like really, really strong, upper, very broad upper body. And I think that that works well to have that body mass on top. I think that works really well for um, for sleeping. And if, and again, as little as Caitlin is, she's actually broad. She's broad in the shoulders. So I think that also contributes to her ability to be a great sleeper. Core. Uh, you can't do enough core, really. Um, you know, you got to kind of work all aspects of, of your core. Uh, the ball rollouts would, would also be an example of that. And then a couple of things that I think get overlooked a little bit uh, sometimes is just grip strength and hip stability. I think the hip stability thing kind of also goes with um, throwing a rock, but it's some of those deep muscles, those deep hip muscles that don't necessarily get worked all the time, but I think help in terms of the stability and the leg movements and the shuffling of your feet, your sweeping. And the grip strength, I think, I was actually surprised to see that Brad doesn't have a glove on, but he must have incredible grip strength. Um, uh, I think grip strength is really important. You don't necessarily need to work it specifically unless I think there's issues, but I think as long as um, as long as maybe the player is doing uh, weight training that involves lifting weights like trap bar deadlifts or barbell deadlifts or something that, um, you know, forces them to be gripping onto a bar and uh, as part of an exercise and lifting a fair amount of weight, I think that contributes to grip strength. Uh, but I just think I wanted to mention it because I think that it gets overlooked a little bit in terms of the ability to sweep. I think when you have a great grip strength, you have more confidence to be able to lean over the broom uh, because you know you're not going to slide down the shaft of the broom. So some theories, uh, lots of theories out there, especially in the last, uh, you know, four or five years since we had, um, you know, uh, the, the year of crazy sweeping, uh, broomgate for lack of a better word, I'll, I'll maybe refer to it as that because I don't have a better word to, re to use. Um, you know, there was always some theories out there about uh, whether or not corner sweeping did anything. And if you did corner sweep, what corner do you sweep on to make it finish? Uh, and then in 2015, 2016, when we had Broomgate, then all sorts of things started happening. <laughs> and it was a really, uh, really, really frustrating year as a sweeper. Um, I found it really um, challenging to show up every week at an event with something different on the head of my broom. I found it very challenging to try to keep up with understanding what these broom heads were doing. And I found it really challenging to sort out the communication around all of that. Um, so I'm glad that I'm really glad that that got um, under control. <laughs> so even with um, the brooms now that, uh, you know, what was discovered that year was that we could make rock, make rocks curl as well as keep them straight. And part of that was the direction that was in front of the direction of the broom head in front of the rock. So now that the brooms have been uh, sort of, for the most part, taken out of the equation. There's still some theories and questions out there about what's the best broom angle. Can you actually make a rock curl? And and this was a theory or a question for years, obviously, as far as we can remember, how far can you drag a rock? And then there's some question about pressure versus speed. So, um, you know, I think that there's, it's safe to say that a lot of teams out there right now do still believe that they can make a rock curl. And obviously, you're, they're trying to get every millimeter that they can out of their shots and trying to manage that. Um, in order to test these theories, there's so many variables with curling that it can be really challenging to do so because there's ice conditions. Uh, the number of rocks you've thrown in a path. And then, like I said, uh, I think there's a difference between men and women. Uh, so men 
the research that's been out there is that they max out their their inside sweeper maxes out on the ability to create uh, friction and heat in front of the path of the rock. Whereas women, to my knowledge and from the research that I know, they do not max out on that. So women, the second sweeper for women still has more of an impact than not. And I would say based on testing that I've been involved with, especially for distance. So with men, even with distance, it doesn't, that second sweeper doesn't really make much difference, but with women, it makes a difference. And so sometimes I think that's why you'll see two sweepers, particularly more so with, with women. And I know when I was still playing, uh, even on a shot that was maybe um, a back line or a half weight shot, and if it was a little bit light, but we were sweeping to keep it straight, I would still sweep it because I thought maybe I would help it a little bit by giving it speed. Because if we give it speed, then we would be able to keep it straighter. Um, whereas in a men's game, you likely wouldn't see that because that second sweeper really isn't doing anything. So I think that you have to be aware that there's a difference between, um, between the men and women uh, in terms of sweeping and when to have two sweepers uh, and when you don't need two sweepers and you can save some energy. <laughs> so I think these are some of the teams to watch um, when you're working with your own teams or uh, maybe want to test out some of your own theories. Uh, these are teams that I know do a lot of work around uh, this around sweeping and testing some of these theories, I would say the number one team for you to watch would be Botcher, Team Botcher. They do more testing than anybody out there and they test all sorts of things. And if you remember last year, you probably saw sometimes they would add their second sweeper, but that second sweeper would be on such an angle that it looked bizarre, but that what they were trying to do was create the same angle as the inside sweeper with their broom head, but from the other side. So if you remember seeing that, they had theories on that. They do a lot of testing. And one of the big advantages that their team has to do the testing is that Darren Molding is ice maker. So he will make the ice for them exactly how they want it, that they can do testing on straight ice or frosty ice or curling ice. And that's the other thing too, is that, when you're watching these players or when you're doing some of your own testing with your teams or people that you're teaching, the ice is a, ver a big variable. And, I, and if the ice is frosty, there's still a theory out there that you're still creating that scratching, uh, scratching of the ice because the frost has built up that you're actually creating scratches in the frost that that rock will follow, which was the theory that we saw in 2015, 2016 with the brooms scratching the ice that it would follow those scratches. So that theory is still there a little bit, but it's more so when the ice is frosty. And I think teams feel that they will have more of an effect on the rock when the ice is curling more um, than if they're in a curling club, perhaps that the ice is a little bit straighter. But if you're looking for, you know, tips or information or, you know, what obviously what the pros are doing, Team Botcher is by far the number one team, I would say, to, to watch. So in terms of drills and testing, um, from the biomechanics standpoint, I mentioned already the Smart Broom. Uh, that was a really, you know, really great and, and continues to be a really great tool for people to improve their sweeping. And the beauty of it is that immediate feedback. Um, you know, what we found that we would do is we would sweep one way and then we would change something biomechanically and we would sweep another way and we'd make another adjustment and we'd sweep another way just to see what was working best to increase our head speed and to increase our um, our pressure on the broom. And we, you know, sometimes combine that with video analysis and playback, especially if we were working, trying to work on some some footwork and I mean video analysis is a great important part of our game and we do a lot of it with 
delivery and the technical analysis of the delivery. Um, I do think it's really important for sweeping analysis as well. And when you combine that with the smart broom, you're going to get a ton of feedback. And then once that base is there and once the idea of the best position for the player is there, it's literally about repetition and doing it over and over and over again and building the habit of doing the footwork properly, of getting over the broom. And obviously there is, uh, you know, a, a strength and conditioning component to that. And much as I talked mostly about strength on my strength training uh, slide, there's obviously an endurance part to sweeping as well that's really important. Uh, and then, you know, to have that and get the repetition on the proper biomechanics is just like your curling delivery. It's repetition, repetition, and building those positive habits so that when you're in competition, it happens naturally and it's not something that you need to think about. In terms of the theories, um, you know, like I said, it, a lot of the top teams continue to do their own testing to you know, try things out and um, and see what works. Some of the things that are important to think about when if you're doing some testing with your teams or um, or players is having the same thrower. You know, not, you know, we have a we have a rock throwing machine about an hour here from Winni uh, from Winnipeg in Morris, and it's a great it's a great tool. It's super consistent. There's still a few variables I find with it, um, but it, it can be helpful for the exact reason of having that consistency. So you're going to get more consistency from the same thrower than if you're changing throwers all the time. So uh, that's something that's important. Using the same rock, uh, you know, eventually, eventually that rock might start to break down so you could switch it if you wanted but basically you'll see the next point here control rock each time so if you were going to do a test on whether or not you could make a half weight intern curl you would want to throw a control rock in that spot to see what the reaction is and then you need to throw the same rock with the same thrower and then you have your sweeper go post to post and try to sweep to make it curl to see what results you might get. Then if you wanted to try sweeping it to keep it straight, you have to throw another control rock before you do the sweep to keep it straight. Because you've swept one rock down that path, it changes the path. So you always need to throw a control rock. But at some point, if you switched sides of the sheet and decided to try uh, a different sweeper um, from the outturn side to try to make it curl, you could maybe switch rocks at that time so that you're not breaking down the same rock all the time. But these are some of the variables that we deal with in our sport that you need to try to minimize as much as possible. And then when you're doing the testing too, you, you could do post to post sweeping, but you could also do hog to stop because it's very seldom that you're going, going to see players sweeping to make a rock curl from post to post. You might see them go post to post on keeping a rock straight or even for speed. It's very seldom you would see one go post to post to, to make it curl. So you want to have an idea of how much of an effect you're having, um, you know, from start to finish, but also from more of a, like from the hog line to when it stops and how much impact you're having there, because then you have an idea of what uh, impact you're having so that when your players are actually playing in a game, they might have a better idea of what impact they're having in those particular uh, conditions. And in terms of testing how far you can drag a rock, speed traps would be a real benefit here because you could have the thrower throw the same speed repeatedly. Um, my suggestion that if you have the rock hawk speed traps, you would set up one beam maybe six or eight feet past the nearest hog line to the thrower and have that thrower try to repeat the velocity that they're uh, repeat the velocity uh, over and over again um, and then have your sweepers start from the opposite side of that beam and uh, see how far they can carry it and again you have to think about things like the control rock especially uh, because of sweeping in that path and it changes the speed so uh, you know those are just some of the things to to think about. And now we're going to open it for questions. 
Okay, I will unmute everybody if I can find the right button. All right, now's your opportunity. Ooh, we have some feedback, so maybe somebody's on two devices at the same time. Okay. Yeah, it's still happening. Can I? Okay. I'm going to mute everybody again. So please use the chat box for questions and, and uh, I'll relay them to, to Jill. What is the difference between post to post and hog to stop? Oops, Jill. Uh, oh, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear okay. you now. Yes, yep. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks, Dick, for your question. I, I guess I, was, I apologize, it's probably a little bit too specific lingo maybe, but I, when I say post to post, I just mean from sweeping right out of the thrower's hand until the rock stops or until it makes contact with another rock. So that would be post to post, like beginning to end. And when I was explaining hog to stop, what I was referring to was the hog line nearest the end of where the play is taking place and uh, to where the rock would stop. So more so it would be, I don't know, that might be five or seven seconds worth of sweeping at that point. Okay. Do you uh, find- when you get your question, how often do you change your broom head? And for competitive juniors, uh, what's realistic? Yeah, really great question. And I think that there's some theories around that as well. Um, when I was still playing, we were changing our broom heads every game. So we would have a fresh broom head because that was the theory that came out in 15, 16, is that the broom heads were only lasting a game. I think now, uh, I think now you're probably, I hear, I hear that some, some players feel that the brooms are more effective the longer, or the heads are more effective the longer you use them. So they might use them for 10 games. Um, so I think it's hard to sort of answer that question about what's realistic for competitive juniors because these elite players, of course, are getting broom heads like they just get them for from their sponsor for free, right? So um, it's kind of hard to answer that question. But I think when your broom heads start to get really dark and dirty, I think it's really important to, you know, make sure that, that, that they're being changed prior to that. And then, again, you could do some of your own testing, really, about what you think or, you know, paying attention to that in a game and what sort of impact you think you're having with a new broom head versus one that's been used for 10 games. Uh, okay. Diane. Hi, Diane. Um, yes. Let me see. Um, do I still have presenter role? Yes. Yes, you do, Jill. Uh, actually, no, I don't. Uh, oh, somehow... Somehow Melissa took my presenter role. <laughs> okay, I will reclaim it from okay. Melissa. Bad Melissa. Oh. Okay, and now I'll give it back to you. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, yes, okay. Diane, did you uh, care if it was open or closed? Okay, can you see this, hopefully? I just opened it in. Yep, it's on my screen. Okay. Go, 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 go. Go, 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 Still need that encouragement when you're doing practice sweeps. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll show the other one here too, Diane, the closed. Maybe while that's finishing up, I'll just take a look at the next question. What sweeping-related injuries did you have to manage most, and what did you do to manage them? Um, yeah, great question. I think probably the biggest one would have been my shoulder, so sort of upper 
up like upper trapezius like so shoulder um shoulder neck sort of area because of course I I swept on the same I literally swept on the same side for like 23 years which I would not recommend to anybody now I think that it's important to be able to have the um, ability to sweep on both sides especially given the nature of mixed doubles and being able to be a very versatile player I would strongly suggest sweepers learn how to sweep effectively on both sides uh, I literally swept on the same side for 25 years so um, I had, uh, yeah, shoulder and neck issues for the most part were my biggest sweeping related things, um, strength training, working on those again, th that's, this is where the stability muscles come in. Some of those deeper stabilizing muscles that, uh, you know, you work, you do rehab type exercises on, you don't necessarily feel like you're getting stronger, but it's working those, uh, deep stabilizing muscles. I think that's important. I think for me, truthfully, one of the best treatments I ever got was, um, I can't remember the official name for it or the technical name for it, but it's called dry needling. Uh, lots of physiotherapists do it. Uh, some chiropractors do it. Honestly, that was night and day on my body to be not just on my shoulder, but having that dry needling to release the tension in those muscles made a really big difference. And then being able to build my stability and strength back on top of that after that tension was gone made a really big difference. Um, in the in probably the last quadrennial, as I again started to get based on building strength and getting more weight on the broom, my uh, my forearms actually started to tighten up a little bit from the grip that I had on my broom, uh, and it was just sort of chronic tightness. It didn't really prevent me from doing anything but again getting those dry needles made a really big difference uh for COVID-19 one player sweeping in games should the non-sweeper follow along or stay completely out of the way I would suggest that that sweeper follow along I think that that sweeper can be a really important can play a really important role on the management of rocks so that person doesn't have to worry about sweeping. They can judge the weight. They can communicate the weight. They can watch um, the line. They can do all sorts of things from that role. And I really felt that, you know, even, even pre-COVID, when we would only have one sweeper, I always felt that that's what my role was if I wasn't sweeping. I was the main person to communicate, the main person to uh, uh, judge the rock and it's not that the other person didn't have a say in what was happening with that but I think that that outside person can really play a role in the management of uh, the outcome of the shot. Do I have a uh, preference of either mitts or gloves? Um, yes I would say still gloves uh, simply because I find with mitts because they got a bit, they have a bit of bulk in them that they can, your hand can still sort of move around on the shaft of the broom. Um, and you may not have the best grip, but I would still say that mitts are better than nothing. Kale switches sides with each stance. Any reason? Well, she doesn't change her down arm. So hopefully that makes sense. So her left arm is always the arm that is uh, on the lower part of the broom. So when she switches sides, she she goes automatically goes from a closed stance to an open stance. There are there are a couple of people I think that can do both uh, or that can switch their down arm. I know Colin Hodgson on Team McEwen is one of those people. That's that's really really hard to do. So that's the only reason that Caitlin has a closed stance versus an open stance is because she's on different sides of the rock, but her down arm does not change. I hope that makes sense, Dick. Diane, you're welcome. Wendy, are there other off-season sports activities that you found support sweeping apart from specific dryland training? Yeah, good, good question. Um, yeah, I, I would probably... Well, you know what? If you're playing any sports, it's going to contribute to your ability to be a better athlete, really, at the end of the day. Uh, I could think, pardon me, I could think of playing um, soccer would contribute to endurance. Um, you know, even even volleyball and the jumping that's involved in volleyball would contribute to the 
power that you could be getting out of the hack. Um, yeah, so really, I just think being active in, in anything gives you the ability to be a, a better athlete. Any more questions? Good questions, everybody. Mm -hmm. I hope I answered them okay for everybody. Diane, uh, did you have a question about the open and closed stance, or did you just want to see the replays? So you can answer in the chat. Okay. Um, more here, yeah. Do I miss the competition? Sometimes, yes. Um, as time goes by, it's becoming less. I think the hardest was probably the first year because it was really bizarre not to be on the ice with my team. Um, so I miss some of the competition, but I also know what comes along with being able to play in those competitions, and I do not miss that. What do I miss most about competitive play? Just probably the, the competition, playing in the arenas and those big events, uh, you know, and the fun of that. But again, I know what come, what it takes to be there, and I don't miss that part of it. Glenn, in our testing, we have found that two brushers is better than one for either carry or for hold, even for men, at board weight and below. Yeah, that makes sense. I uh, I think the most important point for any team is to have a brushing strategy that 100% agree with you, Glenn. It, it's going to be different probably for everybody, but they have to buy into it. If their weight control is great, then two brushers may not be required. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think, um, you know, Glenn, I'm not sure. Oh, you added one more. So one thing you didn't mention is how much brushing may be related to the number of rotations thrown. Ah. That hasn't been studied to my knowledge, but as a factor. Yeah, you're right. I don't know. I don't know that that's something that's being discussed amongst the elite players only, only because I think their rotation is pretty consistent. So, and, and when you're playing on arena ice, you have to make sure you have a certain rotation or it, it's, you know, your rocks aren't going to, uh, aren't going to travel, but that's a really good point, Glenn. And, and in terms of the, the men versus women in, in your testing, um, just curious to know. Um, yeah, but I, sorry, Glenn, there is a wide variation in rotations, but I think for the most part, I would say that's something that elite teams um, try to have similar so that their rocks run similarly. At least that's what our team, that's what our team did. Um, I'd, I'd be curious to know, uh, the, the sweeping ability of the people that were doing your testing, just out of curiosity in the men versus women. Will, hi, Will. Thanks for the kind words. Can you talk about how much time sweeping was covered in your daily, weekly practice, how often you were working on it? Yeah, it, you know, it probably depended on the point that we were at a little bit. Um, I think we worked on it less as the season went on simply because, you know, you kind of at some point, I think, have to, um, you kind of work in with what you've got. You, you can't really make major changes mid-season. Um, so I think we spent a lot more time on it in the off-season. Like if we had ice in in August or if we went to Alberta to do training, um, we would work on it there. We would work on it if we had ice here, we would work on it more so at the beginning of the season. And then from there, we might make a little tweak, but at some point it's like, okay, this is what we're working with right now. Like, this, you know, we can make little tweaks, but so I, I would say, and it would depend on the week, how much we would work on it because, it would depend on if we were coming home on a Monday and then leaving again on a Thursday or, you know, that type of thing. But, um, and as our careers went on, I think we actually worked on it a little bit less. So I know that might not be a super clear answer, but I know that that's what we did. So. Um, Jill, do you want me to try opening up the lines again and see if we could ask Glenn? Let's yeah, let's sure. I, yeah, I'd love to hear. 
Let's see if there's feedback now. Mm, a little bit. Do you want to try answering Jill's question, Glenn? No. Uh, sure, I can try. Oh, you're still getting lots of lots of feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll keep it really short. So John Newhook and I have studied um, uh, even elite teams playing at the same event, and there actually is considerable variation in the number of rotations that those teams throw. So Team Holman, Team Holman, for example, has a reputation for throwing more rotations than other teams. That reputation is absolutely deserved. Uh, other teams throw considerably fewer rotations, even on the same ice at the same event. Um, and that's one of the things that we're trying to investigate as to what is the impact of brushing when you're throwing with lots of rotation versus very little rotation. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that that makes all sorts of sense. I think I think what my point was, Glenn, is that I think within the team of Team Holman, they all have that rotation. Oh, for sure. So the, the best the best teams have the most consistent rotations across right. all four players. No question about yeah. that. So that that was kind of that's why I kind of said you know different different rotations. So for right. at the elite level, they have the same, I should say, but it was. So within a team, it's quite obvious that team has has quite a bit more. But yes, that would be very interesting because I don't know if you've done initial testing, but what I suspect that the impact would be less on more rotation. We're not quite there yet. Okay. <laughs> How much as a sweeper do you help the skip understand the release in out unusual rotation on elite teams? Uh, okay, Wendy, if I'm understanding your question, um, when we release a rock, we give immediate feedback to our sweepers. So I think you'll see that a lot with elite teams. As soon as you let uh, a rock go, uh, you say, oh, I think it's a little heavy, or no, no, don't touch it, I was wide, or I put it back, um, you know, things so like that. you're using the thrower more than the sweeper to actually use Pardon me? Communication. You're using the thrower more than the sweeper to say anything. So as a sweeper, you're not saying much about the release. Correct, correct. Yeah. Sweeper's watching the release, but the initial feedback comes from, from the thrower. I coach juniors, so uh, I'm trying to get the sweepers to help. But I, th I, I think the thrower, because the thrower is not always able to self-diagnose, if you will. <laughs> yeah, and that may come with time and with practice, because I, I think, you know, I think that, it, you know, if you're being honest, if you can be honest with yourself and you understand your your delivery, um, you know, you can practice giving that feedback um i do still think it's important for the sweepers to watch that release and to watch what's happening with it because they can still sort of take that into consideration and make their own assessment and then as your throwers get better at making their personal assessment uh, you know it might come together thanks What's the current word on broom head angle? Yeah, um, I'm not very good with explaining things in degrees, but if I'm if I'm correct, I, it's more. It's almost. I think it's still almost more like the. Um, I don't know. It'd be maybe a twenty percent angle like you're, you're more so in line with the rock so you're still like the, the directional sweeping that we saw in 15 and 16 is it's still very much the way to go and and what people what sweepers are finding the most effective so um like the video of caitlin like i said she's probably dropped back more now so she's probably got her body position more behind 
a little more behind the rock or off the back corner of the rock to get that appropriate uh, broom head. And now the, the thing right now, too, is that we're not seeing any curling on TV. So we're, we're, we're seeing a little bit of live streaming, but that's really where you start to get a sense when you can see these teams doing it on TV, uh, especially the ones that are testing all the time. Then you really get a sense for what they are feeling is the best angle. But I still think it's that sort of, 20, 25% angle, if I'm explaining that correctly, um, in front of the, in front of the rock. And would you say this video of Caitlin, she's at about like 45-ish? Uh, yeah, let me just take a look at it again. Yeah. So she's probably dropped, she's probably dropped back. I actually was watching them on the live stream. I can tell you she's dropped back. And has more of a, yeah, I would, I, I'm saying, she, she almost turned a little bit more at the end of that video. Like, uh, see if I can back it up here. See right there? She almost turned a little bit more than she had been. So she's dropped back a little bit. So that would be closer to the angle and is at it, the end is here. Able to, is she able to drag the rock a little further from being behind in that? situation? Well, I, I don't know. I don't have an answer for you on that. And actually, Glenn might be able, based on all of his uh, testing, uh, might be able to give you a bit of an answer on that. I think that there is, my understanding is that there's even a little bit of discussion about whether um, the speed of the head of the broom has more impact on line than it does on dragging a rock. And that you could simply drag a rock by just pressure sweeping and not even moving the broom head. So, um, oh yeah, Glenn said he has no information on that. <laughs> um, yeah, so so I, I know there's some discussion there about about whether the speed of the head actually impacts dragging it. Um, but I, I, I think that right now you're still seeing, for the most part, you're seeing players utilize both the pressure and the speed of the head to do their sweeping. Okay, and last, last follow-up on that. So you mentioned that there was some discussion on open versus closed and that that might be more discussed in the future like what did you mean by that well what i meant by that is that is simply because we've seen team Kui start to play around with that angle um on the open versus closed and so because they're doing that i was thinking that we might start to see more of that and maybe a little bit more discussion around that uh because i think typically it's been perceived and taught that closed stance is more effective from a mechanical and strength perspective. Um, but now with the directional sweeping, that open stance gives you a bit of a different angle. And I just won't be surprised to see more of it because we've seen a top team like Team Kui uh, use that to their advantage. So, Glenn, Joe, do you know anything about that? If you guys tested yeah. that. <laughs> you know, Joe, would you mind if I, uh, if I address that just a little bit? Not at all. Go right ahead. Okay, so um, between the testing that John Newhook and I have done, so we've measured around 700 athletes in the last four years, at the competitive level, like at the tour level, there's actually very little difference in mean force between an athlete brushing open versus an athlete brushing closed. It's it's noise. It's it's one or two percent difference, but you know, overall, there's there's actually very little difference because the athletes are accomplished, they're strong, they're fit, they have good core strength, you know, all those other things. However, if you're coaching a junior women's team, then it's another ball game. And in the testing that we've done, closed is substantially better than open for junior women because um, in brushing closed, you have an opportunity to get the brush head underneath your chest and apply more uh, vertical force to the brush just from body weight as opposed to brushing open. So there's like a, a nine percentage difference between closed and open if you're, if you're coaching junior women. 
So it does matter what sort of cohort you're looking at in terms of um, what kind of efficacy are you going to see um, across across the board across those athletes. But at the at the you know at the um, train to excel level at the at the tour level, there's very little difference between brushing closed and brushing open. So Glenn, when you say there's very little difference between open and closed at the tour level, like what is what does um like what does that mean? Are you talking about the pressure and the speed that they get, or did you literally look at the effect of the rock? Like so the- so so in our testing, we're looking we're looking at pressure, so or looking at vertical force to be to be um, more correct. And for brushing open versus brushing closed, we're seeing, you know, if if somebody's brushing open, then they might have a, you know, 41% normalized mean force. So that's the force they're applying through the broom divided by their body weight. And at brushing closed, it might be 42%. So so really very little difference between them. Right. Um, so I in think terms of, in terms of in terms of brush speed. Um, that tends to be, first of all, very difficult for athletes to control, to either go faster or slower and do it consistently. And secondly, most athletes, in my experience at least, brush at a speed that is um, natural to them, to use to use that word. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's very difficult to get someone who's used to brushing at, you know, 3.9 strokes a second to all of a sudden brush at 4.6. And there's also a there's also this inverse relationship in human performance between speed and and pressure. So the faster you brush, what what tends to happen is if you brush faster is, is that you put less vertical force on the brush, right. and vice and vice versa. And so and so athletes tend to find a sweet spot sort of all on their own. And in the testing that we've done, that sweet spot tends to be somewhere between 3.8 and 4.3 strokes a second. Right. That that tends to be true across the board. Yeah. So that makes complete sense to me. I think the theory that Team Cooey is doing, it has nothing to do with how much force they're getting on the broom, but rather the angle of the head in front of the rock and the impact it's having on the trajectory of it. Yep. And that's something that John and I wanted to study this year, except the pandemic got in the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would, I would love to chat with you about that when you get some uh, some more results going this year. Yeah. So Jerry Peckham had asked us to put a study together and go to Morris and actually do this. And that's what we had in mind. And we wrote up a proposal. But with the pandemic, we can't make it happen this year. Yeah, of course. All right. Well, we're at 8.06. Um, Jill, thank you so much. It's been very informative. Um, Great presentation from Dick Henderson. Thanks for your honest insights and sharing your personal preferences. Uh, It was just super. Glenn, thank you as well for your input. Um, It's always nice to have um, as much information as possible. So this has been absolutely great. The video recording will be coming out, or the webinar recording will be coming out in a few days. Please uh, remember that this is for your personal use, use with your teams. Please do not share it widely, (laughs) wildly too. Um, And thanks, everybody. There are two more webinars coming up October 19th with Rick and Krista on training in the absence of competition. And then I think it's October 28th with Kathy Goche, um, team positions, et cetera. So, Have a good evening, everybody. Stay safe, and uh, thank you very much. Jill, I'll be in touch with you shortly. Sounds good. Thank you, everyone.